Hello and welcome. My name is Juanita Headley. I am a New York attorney and the founder and CEO of Changing Cases. You are listening to a set of podcasts, a series dealing with the issues of human trafficking, child abuse, and of course, keep a secret, keep a, keep knowing how to respond to the question you keep a secret, oh, keep a secret. over the following weeks and months, I will be tackling some hard hitting topics with a view to educate, empower, and inspire you to change the way that you think, act, and respond to better safeguard the children in your world. Stay tuned until the end of this show, where I'll be sharing not only how you can get a copy of my new book, but I'll also inform you of some upcoming live Zoom trainings and how you can contact me to have your questions featured in a future episode of this show. So we can talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about it. Yeah. So we can talk about it. Talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's talk about the issues of grooming and the question, what is your currency? Today's episode is actually by special request by one of my regular attendees in my weekly Zoom meetings. Grooming and currency are topics I have picked up on in previous sessions, but I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail to give you greater clarity on the concept and the question what is your currency? Now, in doing so, I'm going to make reference to my new book, Can You Keep a Secret?, where I talk about the topics of human trafficking and child sexual abuse and my own personal story of being a victim of sexual exploitation from the ages of four to ten by my mother's first husband. Now, when it comes to currency, the dictionary definition of currency is simply this a system of money in general use in a particular country or the fact or quality of being generally accepted or in use. Now, the thing about currency is that depending on which country that you're in, currency changes. When I talk about currency in relation to people, I'm discussing the issues of vulnerability, which is greatly linked with grooming. Grooming and vulnerability go hand in hand. Now, no matter our age, our ethnicity, no matter our background, every single one of us in whatever shape or form has vulnerability. Now, quite often when people think about men are from Mars and women are from Venus, they think that men are always driven by what they see and they're always driven merely by sex, that they think with their genitals and not with their head, and that women, they are motivated by what they hear. Now, when we consider that, it makes sense that quite often you will find that men are interested or sometimes addicted in pornography, whether that is photographs, whether that is videos. It is imagery, things that they see with their eyes. Now, with women, on the other hand, I found that women's type of pornography is quite often found in the cover of a book. What do I mean by that? There are books such as Mills and Boons, which is showing my age, but... Mills and Boons is from my mother's generation, and that was a set of books that is pretty much a woman's form of pornography. It is romance books with sex scenes. I remember reading once on a Christian website about how women have to be very careful what they expose themselves to. Now, some of you may remember the book Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, Fifty Shades of Grey, I've not read it and I've not seen the movie, but that involved BDSM, which is Bondo Sadomasochism. With BDSM, this is where one person is more dominant than the other, or there may be multiple people, but it involves sexual activity with the use of whips and chains, with the use of force and brutality for the purposes of gaining and accomplishing a new type of sexual high or sexual level. Now, when a woman reads Mills and Boons, she's not seeing visual imagery. She's reading it, and those words will create an image in her mind. A lot of women would fall in love with Mills and Boone's characters. Now remember, these characters are fictitious, they're not real. But the way that they've been written, the words on the page, would bring these men to life in this woman's head. Now we have to consider the power of words, and I say that because quite often, 
women end up ensnared by men, if I can use that term, by the things that they hear. Now let's go back to the story of the Garden of Eden. For those of you who do know the Bible, right at the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam and Eve. For those who do not know this story, according to the Bible, in the Old Testament, God, Jesus Christ and God, they are one and the same. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. He then created a man who was called Adam, decided that because Adam is alone, he needs a companion, and so God created Eve. And he created Eve not from his foot bottom. I say that because there are some Christian men, Christian leaders, who treat their wives, their spouses, as though the Lord had taken Eve from the foot bottom. The Lord actually took Eve from the side of Adam. And I say that because I believe the Lord wants us to be walking side by side with our spouses, not to be walking behind or in front. Now, in the garden that the Lord had created, this was a paradise for both Adam and Eve to enjoy all that was there. But there was the tree of good and evil and the tree of knowledge. Now, unfortunately, sin entered into the world as a result of the actions of Eve and Adam. Now, in the Garden of Eden, according to the Bible, Adam and Eve were completely naked. They had on no clothes. They were completely naked. And so Eve is standing and the serpent, as we would know him as Christians, would know him as Satan or the devil. The serpent comes up and starts to engage with Eve. Now, when we think about that story, looking back many, many years later, there are many of us who have the question, why was Eve even talking to a snake? I mean, let's be realistic. Let's say that you have a pet goldfish, a pet hamster. When your pet goldfish starts to speak to you, are you going to speak back or would you freak out and run away? Realistically speaking, if our animals, if our pets started talking to us, the majority of us would think we've either drank too much, smoked something we shouldn't have, are delusional, or we're simply hallucinating. Most of us are not going to start engaging with that animal. Now, that's where Eve was different from your average person because she started to conversate with the snake. As a result of that conversation, despite the satisfaction that she already had in Christ, she decided, I don't have enough satisfaction, I need an apple. She took an apple off a tree and she ate a piece. And then what did she do next? She went up to her husband, Adam, and in the Bible, they were married. I must point it out, they were married. She goes up to her husband and she offers him a bite of the apple. Now, remember what I said earlier, women, it's by words, by the words that are written in a book or the words that they hear. Men, visual, hence why a lot of men watch or have addictions with pornography, visual imagery. Now, Eve and Adam, they were naked, as I just said. Eve eats an apple because she was in conversation, in dialogue with a snake. And then she walks up to her husband and she's naked and she has an apple. Eve is a man. Eve is a woman. Adam is a man. Adam, as a man, sees a naked woman with an apple. And so when he sees a naked woman, he eats the apple and sin falls into the world. So you've got to understand that because of the dynamics of how we're very different, that has a lot to do with how we may interact and engage with one another. And I say that because in relation to grooming and in relation to a child who's been a victim of sexual abuse for countless years, that vulnerability is like a flashing neon light on her forehead or on her back. Imagine this girl's been abused systematically hanging out with friends at the mall or the shopping center, a guy comes up to her and her friends and starts talking to them. Now he can observe by her body language and behavior, her insecurity, the fact she doesn't think she's attractive. And then a few weeks later, when she tags, she's in the mall, guess who turns up? The same guy. We have to think about what we're putting out there. There are times that we're in control and times we're not. When you have a neon sign on your forehead that others are attracted to, that is something you cannot control. Unfortunately, we look in the mirror and don't see that neon sign, but other people do, which is why we attract certain friends and certain relationships. However, what we post on the internet, we're in control of. So when you're tagging where you are, when you're telling people your personal problems, when you're complaining and venting about your family, your siblings, you're making yourself vulnerable. When you post on Facebook, I don't like my mum, I wanna run away from home, there are people who see that and will pounce on that information and take advantage of that. 
So we have to understand, we give off information, some that we control and some that we don't. Now with the neon flashing light, how do we change that? Now you can't just wake up one morning and then all of a sudden your vulnerability has gone away. I wish it was that simple. Realistically, it isn't. What I will say, and I say it time and time again, with therapy, counseling, prayer and healing, the brain is completely restored. Because when you've been sexually abused as a young child, that creates dysfunctions in you and it affects the development of the brain. But there is hope and healing is available. When a person has a broken a brokenness, whether that's a broken heart, whether that's the defects in the brain, when they have a brokenness, that can be seen and read by people. Sometimes it is so subtle that even the other person doesn't know what they're seeing, but there's something that draws them towards you. Even myself, many of my clients say that I really appreciate the way you listen to me. You listen to me like no other. You're very inspirational. There's something in me that attracts them and there's something in them that draws me towards them. In other words, my interactions with them are very wholesome and positive. And even if sometimes I may not be 100% listening or 100% attentive because I'm typing as they speak, I'm human, I get distracted. There's something that I'm giving off to them that shows I do care and I am here to support you. And that's what we have to understand. There are things we give off without realizing it. And sometimes that surprises me because when I'm typing up a client's notes and reading emails and listening to them, I'm doing multiple things. I am successfully multitasking. I have one ear to what they're saying and another ear on the information I'm reading. But despite that, that client still feels Juanita is hearing me. Now, that's an amazing thing because I have good and pure intentions. But you've got to understand that there are people, pimps, traffickers, abusers, who also have that ability and that skill to be able to listen despite being distracted, despite multitasking, that ability to listen, the ability to support and with that gifting that they supposedly have, if I can use that term, they use that to take advantage of the person in front of them. Whatever it is they want to take from that person, whether it's their body, whether it's their money, whatever it is they want to take from that person, they will succeed at doing so because they've been able to breach over that wall that we sometimes have to protect ourselves and they have created a bond with the person. I'm sure I've said it before that there are women and girls who date men a lot older than them and they make the statement, I'm with him because he listens to me. Even somebody I was recently talking to, she shared with me that she's happy. But on the other hand, she told me about all the things that are wrong in the relationship. And from the way she described the relationship and from her own words, it sounded like she was actually prostituting herself. She cooks and cleans and looks after this guy. And in return for that, he gives her sex and money. That sounds like prostitution. And she used a term similar to describe the interaction. We often settle for second best without realizing it. When I listened to a sermon a few weeks ago at church, the pastor who was preaching talked about a dog that is sniffing the ground. His owner is waiting for him, but the dog is sniffing the ground. And then the dog sees some dog poo and sniffs the dog poo. The master, the owner of the dog says, come. But the dog continues to sniff the poo. Sadly, a lot of us are sniffing poo. I don't mean literally. I mean, a lot of us are content and supposedly happy in situations that are not wholesome, that are not positive, in relationships we should not be in, we consider it to be happy because we don't realize there's something so much better than that poo in the ground. It's like that picture on Facebook. The child is holding on to the small teddy bear and will not let go. The father's hand is outstretched in front of the child. His hand is outstretched. And behind his back, he has a massive teddy bear. Sadly, far too often of us, men and women, are holding on tightly to the little teddy bear. We're sniffing on the poo without realizing our master is standing there with something so much better. When you don't realize your worth, when you don't know your value, what happens? You settle for the poo. You settle for the small teddy bear. And when you settle for that, that makes you vulnerable. Why? Because you're settling for second best. You're settling for a person who doesn't respect you, who isn't patient or kind or loving, who treats you like dirt. You're settling for somebody because he pays the bills. You have sex with him because you have a ring on your finger. You're settling. And when you settle, that makes you vulnerable because you don't realize that actually this is not the best. And when compromise seeps into that relationship, you'll adjust 
It may be slowly and gradual, but you'll adjust to the compromise. When you're in a relationship with a guy and he asks you to have sex with him and you say no, but he keeps asking and you eventually agree. And then eventually he asks you after some time to have sex with a friend and then you agree. And then eventually he has says, have sex with my friends to pay the bills. You agree. It's just a little bit of compromise that seeps in and then the rest is history. The Bible talks about how a small bit of yeast will impact the whole loaf of bread. Just a little bit of yeast. You add that to the flour and then your bread will rise. With the absence of yeast, you will not have bread. You will have a pancake. You will have a flat pancake. You will have a paraffa. You will have a pitta. There are different names we can call for these flat breads when there's an absence of yeast. Remember, small yeast will make big bread. In the same way, small compromise will eventually snowball into effect. And before you know it, big compromise has happened. It starts with him mistreating you a little bit. And then it progresses on to full-blown abuse. I know of an instance of a person who was in a relationship. When they were in that relationship, the person was 10 years their junior. Now understand it is not an age thing and it is not a cultural thing because they're from two different cultures in two different countries. Ethnically, they were the same color, but they had very different cultures and backgrounds. Now that relationship should never have happened. Compromise seeped in very slowly. Very slowly and gradually it seeped in. Now this person who was in the relationship, the female, devout Christian, was convinced the person she was dating was also devout Christian, but as time revealed, that was not the case. In that relationship, it did become abusive, verbally and physically, and eventually she did walk away. However, in her mind, she knew she stayed with this person, and eventually married him. She knew he would eventually start to use his fists. Now, one thing I'll say with the compromise that started very small, it started with hand-holding. What do I mean by that? I'm not saying there's anything wrong or sinful or immoral with hand-holding. But whilst they would be holding hands, her bo boyfriend at the time, her abuser, as would be a better term, the abuser in this relationship, he would squeeze her hand. And it started very jokingly and in jest. And he kept doing that. And there was occasions when he would squeeze her hand to the point where she would cry out in pain. Now, as I've said before, because I always talk about the Bible and I always go back to scriptures. Love is patient. Love is kind. Now, this is in the Bible. First Corinthians 13. This is love. When a guy says, if you love me, have sex with me. You have to question, is that really love? Because if love is patient, he will not force you to do something you are not ready for. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. Now, squeezing your girlfriend's hand until she screams until she cries out in pain, is not loving and it's not kind. It was very gradual and very subtle. And it was done in such a way that it was seen as a joke. But let's be realistic. Does that sound funny to you? From where I'm standing, if any person squeezes my hand, squeezes a friend's hand, to the point that I or they scream out in pain, something is seriously wrong with that. But unfortunately, compromise creeps in when you feel that this is the only person who will date you. When you believe that you'll be single for the rest of your life, you're getting older. The only person I can find to marry me is this person 10 years my senior. When that is, or 10 years my junior, when that is the way that you think, you will make certain decisions that are harmful to you. When it starts off with squeezing your hand, what will happen when you guys have an altercation in marriage? What will happen when one of the children you have later on in, in the relationship, when that child is crying continuously and you're unable to get the child to be quiet? What will happen when you don't cook his dinner on time when you've not washed the dishes? It starts with hand squeezing and then how will it change? You've got to understand. Remember, a small bit of yeast will impact the whole bread. Small compromise will eventually take over. So we have to understand that. In all contexts and all situations, small compromise will impact and affect. And if it's a small compromise that is positive, then expect a good change. If it is a small compromise that is negative, then expect a very bad and downhill change. So please try to understand that. Now, the question you probably have, what is your currency? Maybe you're wondering, what is your currency? How do I identify my currency to prevent a small compromise that will spiral downhill? Now, some of the currencies are time. Time is a big one, as I've said before. Listening ear, undivided attention, 
one-to-one -one relationship in a platonic fashion, time is a big currency. Love and acceptance is another one. Affection, physical contact, attention, feeling valued and important, money, materialistic items, sex, all of these are types of currencies. And like I've said before, currencies can change. For me, my currency is time. It's like that book, Love Language, which I've quoted many a time and only managed to read it about a year ago when I was in the Philippines. What is your love language? Now, I'd never read the book, but I knew my love language was time. When somebody gives me undivided time, they will become my best friend. If they're single, maybe a future spouse. Time is my love language and time is my currency. Every one of us has a currency. Once you can understand your currency, then it can help you to identify when somebody is coming into your world to take advantage of it. Now, I've shared the story before of a pastor. Now, this pastor was somebody I met when my current currency wasn't time. My current currency was freedom. The country that I was in, I felt like I was imprisoned. I was not able to leave the house. I did not have a key. I didn't have a lot of food. I was unhappy. My currency was freedom. Money in the sense of being able to go out and about. So not money I had to have physically in my hands, but the ability to go out and about. So if that's someone driving me somewhere, paying for my meal, taking me out, not physically having money in my hands, but actually going out and about. And when I was with this pastor in a car, he took me out. And that was my first time going out of the house. I had been inside without having the facility to go out, not having the finances to go out. I didn't have any currency in that local country. And this pastor said he would provide me support in my work in human trafficking prevention. He picked me up in a taxi and we traveled to the mall where we met somebody and we spoke and communicated. We met a few times and I will say I was not comfortable with our interactions. On one such occasion, he said to me that he was going to organize for me to speak on the TV and he said that I could sleep in his home. He said that I could stay there overnight because he was concerned about me being able to get back into the place I was staying. Now, I never told him I had issues getting out of my house. I simply said to him, for me, I don't have the facility to do so. So I can leave if I so choose, but I don't have a key. So I might not be able to get back in until somebody's home. But I never gave the impression that I would be stranded or locked out. And so when he offered me to stay in his house, I was very uncomfortable. Number one, his wife was on the other side of the country. And then number two, when I was with him, the kinds of things he would talk to me about, I didn't feel was appropriate. He asked me why I was wearing a ring on my wedding finger. He asked me about a boyfriend. And that's another story that I'd like to share with you. I was in another country did not have the currency of freedom. In fact, on this occasion, my currency was transport home. I'd spoken and I needed transport to get back to my place of residence. So that would have been my currency. And again, a pastor, different country, different pastor. In our drive to my home, he was asking me about my single status. He was asking me why I didn't say anything about the abuse, which is blaming and very inappropriate. And I didn't appreciate his questioning. Asking me my age is nobody's business. Now, he's married with a wife 10 or so years younger than him. He's been married for at least two decades. Knowing my age, knowing about the abuse, why I did not say anything is a very inappropriate and irrelevant question. And asking me if I'm in a relationship, again, is irrelevant. The nature of our conversation in that vehicle, for me personally, was not appropriate for a believer and a pastor, a fellow believer, from where I stood, and I'm not over spiritualizing, I felt that he should have discussed with me, what's your favorite scripture? What's your favorite song? What would you like me to pray for? Ask me about relationships. How is that wholesome? How is that edifying? How is it glorifying God? As a Christian who's single, ask me about relationships is not important. Because at the end of the day, if I'm single, there's nothing to ask. In the sense of, I'm not wearing a wedding ring. When I speak, I make it clear I'm single. So ask me about relationship status. What are you trying to do? Similarly, another time, my currency was transport. And a guy from church, there seems to be a theme here, doesn't there? A guy from church drove me home and he said, if you need a place to stay, you can stay on the couch with me. My wife stays in the other room with the baby. Now, when he said that to me, the way he said those words, it raised a red flag in my head because he told me, 
I can sleep on the couch with him. Those were his words. He did not say I can sleep in the living room with him, which is a room. He said on the couch, singular. He didn't say couches more than one. In other words, what I'm trying to say here, these people in these various instances, in each of the examples, we were in cars together. We were being transported together from point A to B. Either they were taking me somewhere or they were dropping me and going back to their residence. In each of these instances, my currency was transportation. It wasn't time. It wasn't that I needed them to listen to my problems. My currency was transport. They knew I needed transport. They provided transport. And then, as you would have observed, they tried to take advantage of me by going into the whole relationship conversation. All three men were Christians. Two were pastors, one was not. But all three of them asked me about relationships. Isn't that a bit of a common theme? These three incidences took place in two different countries. Three men who don't even know each other. So does that mean you can't go into a vehicle with a man? Does it mean that your currency cannot be transport? Of course not. But I'm getting you to understand that my currency, my need at that time was transportation. These three men knew that. And in their own different ways, they tried to take advantage of that by leading me into the conversation of relationships. And then who knows what else could have gone on if I didn't shut down that conversation. For me personally, because of my strong faith, my strong Christian faith, I don't want to be discussing relationships with anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. That is not a topic of conversation. The Bible is very clear. Old women talk to younger women. If I want to discuss relationships, I will do it in a safe space with other females. I am female. They are female. We think very similarly in a sense of women are often driven by the words they read or the words they hear. When a man whispers sweet nothings into a woman's ear, what does she do? Have sex with him. When a man plays a sex song, what happens? She has sex with him. Words are very powerful and women are very susceptible to words. Knowing that, for me to safeguard myself, I would want to talk about relationships, number one, to God, and number two, to other females in a safe space. Because women cannot be trusted too. So we've got to, of course, think about how do I safeguard myself? I want to be open and transparent with my female friends, my peers. But I don't want to be taken advantage of because, as I've said before, women do it too. Women sexually abuse, women sexually exploit, women traffic. So it's not to say, OK, you talk to a female, you're safe. Far, far from that. But understand, for me, I would feel more comfortable knowing that these men have these intentions to sleep with me. In various forms, their intentions were exactly the same thing. The same pastor I mentioned, the one where my... My currency was freedom and he drove me to meet somebody at the mall. On another occasion, he told me I was crying and he touched my face. Now, if I'm crying, I think I would know. I don't need you to wipe tears that are not on my face. And I was not comfortable. He said, I'm crying. He touched my face and he touched my knee. People have asked me, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you scream? Well, let's be real, guys. When you're groomed, it's often very gradual. It's so gradual before you know, oh, I've been abused. I've been raped. It's such a gradual process. So in this instance, he's talking to me. I'm distressed. I'm angry. I'm dealing with a lot of negative emotions. And because of that, he decides to get close to me under the guise of I'm crying when I clearly wasn't. And he touched my knee. There is no reason for a married man to be touching my knee. There is no reason for that. And when he did that, I wasn't comfortable and I did not know how to respond. There are some women who would freeze, who would fight or would flight. That means would run away. Now, I'm in a vehicle. I couldn't run away. Now, I didn't fight back, but I pretty much froze. And so what would I do differently if that situation occurred? Because of the virus, I would certainly say, you shouldn't touch me. I might have the virus. So that would be my way, my approach to get him to not do that. But what you need to understand so that you don't feel guilty when you sometimes allow somebody to overstep your personal boundaries, you've got to understand that when a person is grooming, they're often very subtle and very gradual. And the grooming may start with a type of touching that is not criminal in nature. And then when they observe your failure to react, then that's when they just overstep a little bit, that little bit of compromise by touching my knee. And then the compromise would grow and grow and grow. And before you know it, I could be raped because it would not be consensual. Now, remember, he's a married man. And that's the thing I want to ask mentally, not to him directly, but mentally. 
If his wife was in the vehicle, would he have done that? And the answer to that is categorically no. When we do certain things, we've got to question our motives. Would we do this in front of our pastor, our parents? Question our motives. And when a person does something to you, question their motives. When a married man kisses you on the face, you are a minor, you're under the age of 18. A married man, a married pastor, a married elder of a church kisses you on the lips, on your neck, in a private place, meaning in a secluded area. He invites you into a room and kisses you in a way that is inappropriate for a married man. When he does that, you have to ask yourself, would he have done this if his wife was right here in front of him? When you have the answer no, you know that he's overstepped. And that is a little bit of compromise. And if you don't shut down that compromise, it will gradually progress and progress and progress. And before you know it, an offense has probably taken place. We have to protect ourselves. Ask yourself in a situation, what is my currency? When you go out of the house and you're hungry, what is your currency? At that time, your currency is food. On one occasion, I was coming back from travels. I can't remember which country because I travel so much. And there was a guy sitting opposite me on the train. When I was on the train, he started talking to me. We started conversing a little bit. And he said, I thought you were with that guy. Because the guy who got on the train with me asked me a question. Now, I am one of those people who do not like people to assume because I'm black, I'm hanging out with somebody who's black. I have no issues with being friends with people the same color as me. But the point I'm making, if I'm standing in a line... But if I'm sitting on a chair, don't assume because the person beside me is the same color. The person behind me is the same color. We're friends. That is ignorance. Because I know from my assumptions, and I know very strongly from my assumptions of living in this world for so many years, XX, secret age, I have not seen or witnessed a person ask two white men, do you know each other? Two white women, do you know each other when they're lining up? But I've had that asked to me. When I was in the airport on one occasion, that's what somebody actually did to me. One of the customs said, are you with that guy? I said, no, I'm not with him. And he stamped my passport wrong and I didn't even realize I was so infuriated. This is the Philippines. There are pretty much no black people in the airport. There's a black guy and a black girl lining up behind each other. They assumed wrongly we're related or we're friends. No, we're not related. We're not in a relationship and we're not friends. So when this guy on the train wrongly assumed that I'm connected to this guy, I was very annoyed by that. I'm from the Caribbean originally, born in England. This guy's an African. We have no connection. I'm not an African, wasn't born there, never lived there. He's an African. I'm a Jamaican, born in England. We have no connection. We don't even look the same. We have no connection at all. I just, I don't like ignorance. So I was quite annoyed by that. But I let it go past and we spoke a bit. When I got off the train, he told me that he works for a very famous hotel. And because of my talks around the world, I said, oh, that's amazing. I'd love you to connect me so I can give my talk. I gave him my business card and he said he'll email me. So he dropped me an email. And as we kept walking, he offered me for a meal. Now, I had just been on the train and I hadn't eaten anything. I had a sandwich, but I hadn't eaten at the time. And he said, would you like to go for a meal? And I said, sure, as long as you're paying. I'm very transparent and very frank, as I'm sure you can tell. And I said to him, as long as you're paying. And so we walked and we managed to find a restaurant that I wanted to try out. We got there and they had a new vegan menu and I ordered from the vegan menu. When we went there, we had a nice time and I enjoyed talking to him. He was a little bit older than me, maybe 10 years my senior, I can't tell. Nice guy, nice chat. One thing I was uncomfortable about is that I had a complaint, not about the food, but about the service. And so he called over the manager, expressed the complaint to the manager. But then he told her that I was so unhappy that I wanted to walk out of the restaurant. I wanted to leave. Now, that was an outright lie. He didn't buy anything. He just ordered himself a bottle of alcohol and I ordered food. Now, from where I stood, I felt as though he did not want to pay for his meal. That's what I felt. My meal, his meal, same difference, meaning the meal that he was supposed to pay for. I thought he didn't want to pay for his meal. And so that's why he said that to the restaurant owner. She said, I'll give you a discount. And he asked if I'm happy with that. I agreed. But remember, I wasn't paying and I didn't care. I was upset with the situation, but I really did not care whether they gave a refund, a discount. I wasn't bothered. I wasn't paying. I was not comfortable with that at all. And I observed him. I, I, I knew he's paying and I wasn't paying and I didn't even need a meal because I had my sandwich. But I observed his behavior. He went to the restroom and he came back. He had a massive suitcase that was around the corner. So when he got up to go to the restroom, I just kept an eye on him, on the restroom and his suitcase. He came back. He eventually paid for the meal. Sometime later, when he had, we, we separated, he told me before we separated that he would email me. And I said, that's fine. He did email me. 
I told him I'd be home in about three hours. He emailed me when we met, before we went for our meal, and then he emailed again about two hours later. And in his email, he said that he'd be hanging around for an extra day at this hotel, and he told me that he was looking to get my response. Now, what bothered me was the fact that I told him I'd be home in three hours. I don't have a UK SIM card and I don't need one. I use Wi-Fi. So I, if I tell you I'm going to be home in three hours and you email me in two hours, then I think you're being impatient. Love is patient. Now, I'm not saying that he loves me, not at all, but I'm telling you a, a demonstration, an act of love, and I mean platonically so, we're strangers after all, love is patient. If I tell you that I'm going to be home in three hours, you need to be patient. Do not harass me and say, oh, I've not got an email back. When he emailed me, I observed he told me he's staying an extra day. I observed he told me the name of his hotel. Now, I don't need to know your name of your hotel. I don't need to know how many days you're staying because I'm not going to go to your hotel and I'm not going to sleep with you. Now, when we met, what was my currency? I actually didn't have a currency right then. I will say I'm a vegan and I love to eat in restaurants. So theoretically, my currency was free food. And so when he took me to the restaurant, he knew he has to pay. He wasn't particularly willing to pay, hence why he made this big drama out of an issue that was very, very small. On that occasion, my currency was technically a free meal. In other words, I want you to understand your currency can change. Because when he met me, he offered me a meal and I agreed, and therefore my currency became a free meal. Now, let's look at it today. Today, what is my currency? I'm at home. I'm in the comfort of my home and I've had my lunch, stroke dinner. My currency today is not a free meal. My currency changes. When you can understand how your currency changes, then you're able to ascertain when a person comes into your world, if they've identified your currency, free meal, and whether that person will be around for the long haul. Long haul. If they're just there to provide you a free meal, they've seen your currency, your vulnerability, you're hungry. That's your currency. They meet your currency. Freedom. Transport. They see your currency, they meet it. But if they stick around, then you've got to determine why are they still here? Remember, currencies change. But maybe they've seen today your currency is a meal. But they know underlining Juanita's currency is time. Her currency is always changing. Consistently, time is her currency. For this woman I mentioned, her currency is sex and companionship. So this guy, she's in a relationship. He provides her companionship and sex. That is her currency. She says she's happy, but she's not happy. She listed to me various reasons why she's dissatisfied in the relationship. She told me she believes he's a pedophile, but she's happy. Realistically speaking, if you believe your partner is a pedophile, how can you say you're happy? If your partner likes to spend money gambling, how can you be happy? When your partner is an idiot at times, how can you be happy? Now, I'm not talking about perfection because nobody's perfect. But let's be realistic. None of us wants to date an idiot. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we screw up. But when this is a person's consistent character, how is that happiness? No, it's not. It's compromise. Now you have to decipher what is your currency? What is your vulnerability? Like I said before, when you're in a foreign country, you don't speak the language. Your currency is translation. When you're lost, it's a map. When you have a phone without Wi-Fi, it becomes internet connectivity. Your currency changes. I want you to consider a young boy who grows up in a neighborhood, let's say the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and his mother has him and a daughter, and he goes to a school, comes home, goes to school, comes home. Is he satisfied? Is he fulfilled? Probably not. And why is that? Because he's missing a father figure. He's missing having somebody to look up to. You have to sometimes question and wonder why is it that young black boys feel the need and the desire to join gangs? Why don't they join clubs instead, societies? And when I say societies, I don't mean like the type you have in the US, but I mean groups where they can contribute, where they can participate. Cooking classes, what about karate? What about a gym group? But they don't do that. Instead, they join gangs. And understand it's not always about making money or selling illegal drugs. It's about having somebody to affirm them. Think about it. If you've never had a father figure, if you've never had a guy who looks up to you or you look up to them, a role model, then what are you going to do? You're going to go looking for that. What about girls who grow up, let's say single mom, no father. What is she going to do? She too is going to be looking for that. It is not always the case, but generally speaking, 
a young boy who grows up without a father, his currency, generally speaking, would be having the affirmation of a father figure. And then with a girl who grows up without a father, generally speaking, her currency could again be having a father figure. Because as I've said time and time again, why do we have young women and girls dating men so much older because he listens, not because he's attractive. And these good old men, good, I say good, loose term, these good old men, what do they do? They know that this girl is looking for someone to listen. So they meet those needs. They get sexual activity with a younger woman, a younger girl. In return, all they do is listen. And do they really listen? That is the question. Just because the TV is off and their phone is on silent doesn't mean they're really listening. Maybe they're simply just enjoying the luxury of having a young woman, a young girl in their arm. But I want you to realize that these men, not all, but these men who seek out younger girls because of that vulnerability, it's because they know the currency of this girl, of this woman, it's time. She's looking for a father figure. And sometimes these women don't even know that. They simply see it as, well, he's a nice guy and he listens. Because I know of somebody who's dating a man 20 years her senior. And she told me she's attracted to older men. And she explained the reason why she goes for older men. Number one, she has trust issues. And number two, these older men do not have young children that they need to look after. And so he has the money to provide for her needs. Now, I find that interesting because her attraction towards old, older men, it is not because they're older, it's because of where they are in life. So the attraction she has, it's not physical, it's not even emotional, it's because of where they are in their life. Like I said earlier about the small bit of compromise, realistically speaking, if there was a guy her own age who was able to provide for her needs, which is to listen, support, provide sex, she would be satisfied. If he didn't have children with lots of women, if he had no children at all, she'd be satisfied because he would not be paying child support. So it's not an older man thing. It is simply how she has made it in her head. This is her way of looking at it. I like older men because their kids are all grown up. They're mature. They're not going to sleep around this and the other. That is not the case because I know of some Filipino women who also date very, very old men. And one of them told me, I date old men why? Because he won't cheat on me. I have to clean his adult diapers and things like this. We have to question sometimes our motives. Why do we do the things that we do? When we can start to understand ourselves better and understand the true meaning behind our decisions and our choices, especially in relationships, that can help us to make better, healthier relationship choices. Because like I said, too many of us are settling for second best. We have a lot of fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. We have a lot of fear. And because of that fear, we make certain choices that are harmful towards us. We may not realize they're harmful, but they are. When we can understand ourselves better, understand our vulnerability, understand our currency and how our currency can fluctuate, when we know that we can safeguard ourselves and we can spot those who have identified our currency and will meet our currency need for their own gain. When someone comes into your world to bless you, there's nothing wrong with that. But what is their ulterior motive? And remember, these pimps, traffickers, and abusers, they are very clever. The Bible says we have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Pimps and traffickers are wise as serpents and often gentle as serpents too. Because they sometimes use brutality and force. They use threats and fear to keep their women, to keep their victims. So they also know that scripture, but they have manipulated it. As it says in the Bible, the enemy takes what is good and manipulates and turns it on its head. We have to safeguard ourselves by knowing ourselves better than anybody else does. And if you are making destructive, and unhealthy choices, you need to understand that so you can protect yourself from making those destructive and unhealthy choices again in the future. I say it all the time to my clients and I'll say it to you. Whenever people say that statement, a leopard cannot change their spots, they are correct, but they're also wrong. A leopard can never change its spots. That is correct and that is fact. However, we have something called cosmetic surgery. A leopard can change its spots, but it requires cosmetic surgery. I'll say it again. A leopard can change its spots, but it requires cosmetic surgery. 
That means whatever relationship you are in, a relationship that is second best, that is harmful, a relationship you should not be in, do not expect him or her to change because a leopard can never change its spots. It needs cosmetic surgery. Even if they tell you that they've had therapy, even if they tell you that they're going to anger management classes, trust me, this is not an overnight fix. This takes time. And for a person to truly change, it requires work. Think about cosmetic surgery. For the leopard spots to change, that takes time. Then there is the healing process. Remember, love is patient. With all things we require to wait, there is patience involved. It doesn't matter who is in your world, whether they are harmful or helpful. For that person to change their defects, the defects in their character, it requires cosmetic surgery. It requires a reshifting. Don't ever allow yourself to be manipulated and believe this person will change. When I marry them, they will change. This person will be different. People cannot change. People cannot change without cosmetic surgery. Call that therapy. Call it prayer. Call it healing. Call it what you like. But with all of these things, it takes time. Even if you pray about it this afternoon, that requires time. It requires you to pray. Prayer is not one second. It's not half a second. It requires you to dialogue with God. Therapy takes time. Counseling takes time. There is a healing process. And remember, when it comes to us, as the saying goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Our human nature, our flesh is fighting with the spirit. No matter how much we may want to be different, no matter how much we may want to change, even with cosmetic surgery, it requires you to walk in the new stripes that you have, to walk in that newness. So remember that. Take note of that. A leopard cannot change its spots without cosmetic surgery. Do not be deceived. What is good is good and what is bad is bad. Just remember that. If a person has bad in them, does that make them a bad person? I don't believe so. I believe everybody has an ounce of good, but maybe that bad that is in that person requires the cosmetic surgery for them to be transformed. We cannot be naive in life. When we're naive, we end up in wrong and harmful relationships. We settle for second best because we believe this person, that's how they are. I can deal with it. I've managed for 10 years. I've managed for 20 years. Let us not accept a little bit of compromise. That little bit of compromise will snowball and it will impact whether negatively or positively. So remember that. What is your currency? Identify your currency. Identify your vulnerability. And number two, don't forget a leopard cannot change its spots without cosmetic surgery. Hold on to that information. Don't forget it. Hold on to it. Remember it. Keep it in your mind. What is my currency? What is my vulnerability? Change takes time. Love is patient with all things. It requires patience. It requires work and it requires for us to wait. Thank you for joining me for an extended season today on the topics of grooming and what is your currency. I say extended season. Why? Because this is a message that I'm going to be talking about consistently throughout the various sessions, I feel it's really important that we understand ourselves, understand our vulnerabilities so that we can protect ourselves from becoming victims of exploitation or abuse ever in the future, ever again, for those of us who've been through that in the past. For those of you who would like to get a copy of my book, you can reach out to me. My website is changingcases.org. That's changing, C-A-S-E-S, changingcases.org. My WhatsApp information is there and my Facebook name is Changing Cases. Please do reach out to me. Tell me your story. Tell me your secret. Ask me your questions. So that way I can share with the world some of the things that are troubling you, some of the things that are bothering or disturbing you, because I'm sure many of us are struggling with very, very similar things. So please do reach out. Be willing to share so that I too can impact the lives of others with issues that are not just your problem, but our problems too. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the seasons and the sessions that we're discussing on these topics. Keep a secret, can you keep a secret? Oh, keep a secret, can you keep a secret? I want to trust you. I want to trust you